So we start with the keynote of uh, Steve. So I guess uh, Steve is familiar for most of you. Uh, he is now professor at uh, Queen's Mary University in London. Uh, before he was in Berlin for some time, and then uh, you got your PhD from Belgium. Netherlands a bit before, uh, and then Belgium. Okay, and uh, so he spent uh, all, uh, almost all of his career doing measurements, traffic measurements, BGP stuff, and quality of service, and, of uh, and so on and so forth. So we'll go through that. Actually. Yeah, exactly. So he presents some of uh, overview of new things, new challenges, and nice uh, uh, understanding. Exactly. There won't be anything new. It's old stuff and basically <laughs> what I learn typically the hard way when doing measurements. Uh, you need to fail in life. If you don't fail, you won't get it. So, title doesn't really mean much. At the end of the day, uh, this is actually aimed for younger audience, which is good because I see quite a lot of young people. Not saying old guys, it's not interesting, but for the older academics, you've seen it. Oh, you've heard like, yeah, yeah, I heard that in my review. So I've seen it before. So it's really targeted at sharing, not how I built up my career, but we'll get into actually a few case studies, which is the main bulk of the talk where I'm going to present a few topics that are measurement centric based and say, hmm, this is how it did unfold, what happened, what went wrong. Eh? All those things that you typically don't see because you just see Google Scholar and the accepted papers. So hopefully it's going to be a useful sharing experience. Feel free to ask questions in the middle or like make it a big brainstorm. Uh, don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Otherwise, you do it offline. So I'm not going to bore you for an hour. I'm planning 45 minutes, hopefully. Well, there is coffee. So. So uh, that's the plan. First, before we get into actually the real meat, uh, we'll get into actually mostly two topics. Uh, what do you want in life as an academic, as a researcher? That matters a lot. Before, not after you stuck into a path and it's too late. Then we'll get into data. Uh, just trivialities, generalities about, mm, yeah, measurements suck, or how do I do? Uh, to collect and handle measurements, but very high level. And then we'll get into uh, the case studies, actually, mostly. All right, that's the plan. So that's going to be, be fast about the first two, three, and then we'll then you I'll expose myself. Uh, so uh, you have to think what makes you happy in life. If you don't know that, you might get disappointed as an academic because there are lots of metrics. And the first one, the only one that should matter is you do stuff you love. That's why I do measurements. I love playing with data and whether I get papers, citations, I don't care, really. Oh, I have to because I'm an academic and there are KPIs, performance indicators that we have as academics, which is for example, publications, getting T1 publication, getting to IMC, to SIDCOM, to whatever, as well as numbers. Sadly, though, numbers, you shouldn't. Be careful as a young academic. Don't publish too much. The more you do, the less you can spend time thoroughly on something. So it's a really tricky trade-off. And once you start doing too much, you're stuck in that cycle. Lots of academics do that. I have in my department lots of professors that do only get EU grants, but then all the other metrics, <clears throat> not, so, not so good. Or they do something else, they just publish papers, but then they don't care about PhDs. And as an academic, you need to tick a lot of boxes, and as a researcher in general. So unless you work for a research center, AT&T or T-Labs, where I used to be, where the money comes to you, kind of, not the case anymore, unfortunately, nowadays. It's not like that. It doesn't come on a gold plate, it, uh, on gold plate. But 
you need to basically uh, think about what's your strategy, what type of collaboration network <coughs> do you want, and how much is it up to you to funding, to fight for funding. And fighting for funding, it's actually harder than fight getting publications done. It's really harsh, like European grants, 8% acceptance rate. US and SF more or less the same uh, in the UK. We beat more lucky, but that's because there are less submissions, it's more political, but it's a different process. So this is a really tricky part of the business. So be careful, it's not just the research. But at the end of the day, if you're not happy, it's really not worth it. So don't get into this. All right, so now let's get into real uh, content related uh, uh, stuff, data, not just meta. Uh, so with data, you know, that's always the case. Once you get it, then comes the problem. You need to store it, handle it, process it, or try, or, and then sell it and manage to convince three painful reviewers that this is amazing. I, they tend to disagree. So handling data, which is why not that many people do it in still a small community, is tricky. But if you love it, I love it, it's fine. Oh, you discover a lot of interesting things. Well, it's actually cool, but it's a bit painful. And yeah, there are a few repositories, but most of the time it's a, I'll abuse the word, active measurements process to get your data. Uh, whether it's passive or active data, uh, you need to have a strategy as to how, not just for my hammer, what's my core business in terms of collecting data? Like Naseo has a nice core business where it goes to uh, Berkeley to XA. Ah, that's witness and analyze guys, like, oof, that helps. I tend to work with ISPs or you know, more operators, because I can't talk to them, that really helps my life. But you need to know how to do this. And when you decide what type of career or type of research you want to do, you have to understand, well, you must have a strategy. So the data will not come to you. So of course, we all know measurements are limited. So there must be a way, and there is always a kind of a way to complement or have measurements to make whatever claim you want to be to make. Hopefully you know what claim you are doing or you'll find out. So of course we have always the passive and the active measurements. Uh, with the passive ones we always have the size issue. Well first you need to get it but that's another matter but there is always the size issue unless you sample and that's a pain or that's typically big if you want something that's meaty enough. And the issue with passive mostly is more that it doesn't represent anything than what it sees of the internet. And the internet is quite large. So it's quite unlikely you'll get something that's, whatever, considered as a ground truth or rep representative enough of whatever you want to look at the internet as a system. So uh, it's limited which kind of means quite often you have this opportunity of using active measurements, not only trace routes, but active end user based measurements to complement that you to then do a controlled sampling experiment where you decide hmm, how brutal will my measurements be. I don't DDoS the internet, though as long as actually it gets me what I want, it can be just as close as to what a DDoS looks like as is necessary to get acceptable data. Uh, people who did not just race routes, but yeah, DNS, better at all. Like, ah, please, you can be brutal. And actually, quite often people don't even notice. So that's convenient. Now you need lots of vantage points. Again, for that, you need the strategy. How do you get the vantage points? Tim Griffin already established quite some time, Planet Lab sucks, forget it. Any paper that is only based on Planet Lab is likely to be rejected straight just because of his Palm 2006 paper. And fair enough, it's not true, I'm exaggerating. But uh, you have to be careful. So you need that measurement infrastructure, typically at the edge because things happen at the edge for the sampling part. Uh, so mm, you need to know uh, how do you get enough vantage points. And at the end of the day, it might still not be a controlled sample of reality. It's still an arbitrary sample that hopefully will be just a bit better topologically than 
passive measurements that will be then stored in just whatever infrastructure is seeing there, a packet trace or even a network wide, like if it's an ISP or an ISP uh, type of traffic data set, which is already big, but it doesn't see that much in terms of end to end in the internet. So you have to think when you want to say something or when you say, mm, I'm interested in that type of topic, what type of mixture do I need and therefore what type of strategy do I need to get the data from typically uh, operator or when it's passive somebody or the university if you can capture traffic or internet wide brutal measurements from the edge which is actually not that difficult to do nowadays we have plenty of face brand friends that can run python or scripts for us actually but it's not so easy yeah so now we'll get into the examples of things that happened that went fine or not uh, that's the case study. So I'll share with you, actually, a big chunk of my career. For data, that's really an asset. That's something you've got to understand how to sell, what's the right way to sell, but it's highly <laughs> worth it. And a lot of researchers, uh, this is a targeted almost attack, underestimate massively the data they have in their hands. They have gold mines. There are lots of things you can do, and we just don't see it. Because we didn't think of it. We didn't have a vision. And quite often measurements, uh, interesting papers come up just, oh, well, I can do those DNS measurements. Oh, I can sample that thing. Like, oh, I don't you see, you have visibility on something, a part of the internet system that like, oh, cool, actually. And that ends up being a paper or a research thread. So don't underestimate the power of actually sampling a specific aspect of the system. Yeah, it won't tell you, okay, what's the internet? How does the internet work? Well, yeah, sure, we won't know that by the time. Anyway, we would know, it will change. But you can get a lot of things from data. So abuse it in the good way, ethically. So first case study, that's one that actually, I just finished my PhD, I was then a postdoc in Belgium, free to travel. Was nice, uh, so I could get anywhere I want, and that's one lucky case. That's probably why I'm an academic. If that one hadn't happened, I would be a normal human with a normal job with a normal salary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's not talk about that. Not worth it. So that's one that actually worked nicely. So what was it? Actually, I did my PhD on BGP traffic engineer. It was dead already at the time. And now I was like, no, don't do this. Ah, no one cares. Oh. I understood it during my PhD. But the interesting thing of um, trying to do traffic engineering, especially for operators, so that we say, okay, let's do something useful with BGP and see what we can treat or rally. Well, I needed traffic matrices. So basically the information of traffic between routing endpoints in the network. You know, well, if we tweak and do magic with routing protocols, that are what happens? Can we, what can we do? And well, there wasn't really much out there but synthetic traffic measures is like, yeah, like as a ground truth, I was like, oh, what's gonna happen in the real world? If a reviewer asks you that, like, I don't know. And if they say, oh, then reject because it's just conjectural and who knows whether that really works. <sighs> Trouble, mm -hmm. no good. So uh, I thought, yeah, well, actually, here I smell an opportunity to actually be able to provide to the research community traffic matrices from actually Geo, an academic network. That was, of course, not a, an operator because then anonymity is like, eh, it's private. So Jean was kind of <coughs> semi-public, we'll see, not completely, but to some large extent. So I thought, yeah, if we can do that, that would be nice in terms of not just impact, but useful because it would have helped me during my PhD. So uh, for that, what type of data do you need? Well, everything. Yeah, that was the wake-up call, like, well, I need to understand routing, traffic, how an ISP works, and replay it. 
over time, not just simulate, emulate the actual real stuff, almost real stuff. So that was actually challenging. And that was, but that was really worth it. So that was not a measurement problem per se, or that was driven by, oh, that's what you need if you want to actually generate the traffic matrices, because you just have net flow samples and then you have to reverse engineer, oh, but what was the actual flow of the traffic across the network? Uh, so for that, you need a tool, and we needed to write that too. Ah, actually, that was worth it. So the challenges were the data size. At the time, that wasn't so big. Now we would, uh, uh, it was like 500 gigs of compressed data per month. Yeah, a few, ter a few terabytes. Yeah, as a postdoc at that time, that was 10 years ago. Anyway, the storage. So you needed a storage area network at the time to do this. So that meant you probably had to go to the data, not bring it at uni and say, mm, well, I don't have this space. I don't have a data center to store it. Then came the problem of synchronizing routing and traffic, which was more complicated than I thought, but that was an interesting technical challenge. And well, we assigned it a lot of challenges. We learned that. That's it. Uh, we do it. And then the main issue that did cost me six months of my life because it took as much time as the duration of the data I was handling. And I couldn't scale it. There was no way I could compress that. I had to replay things and replaying the whole network was almost basically like redoing it live, but in an emulation. So I had to be ready and be free that if I wanted to generate 10 papers within the year from that, forget it. that would have been just one, but it's better worth it. Huh? It was kind of worth it. So as an output, we got that tool, CBGP, if you may know you, to replay the routing uh, of an ISP. Uh, that was very useful in the rest of my career. That's why people say, oh, Steve, BGP is like, BGP, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. It's traffic that I was interested in in the first place, but you want to understand the flow of traffic in the internet and me have measurements and then see something useful about it? Well, you better understand and routing in the internet as well. We got the paper out and the data out uh, of publicly available traffic matrices. It's still online and I still get requests from time to time. And papers actually beyond expectations, but it took five years later and they were not expected. We had no idea they would come out of it. So we had a few constraints from the provider, GL. Yes, we had to anonymize the end host, so just cut slash 24 and then whatever is behind. We, are, we don't care about customers for that specific problem, so that was fine. That did suck. Do not reveal leak utilization. Yeah, that's the problem when you work with data providers. Well, GL is a European funded network, so it's public money. But the utilization was 9% on average, so they were not too happy that we would have data that shows how low the utilization because you used it. Why well, do you need so much money? Actually, well, that's good. Thing. So they say, mm, no, you can't give that away. And when you want to do traffic engineering, link utilization, that kind of matters. So, like, hmm, so I've got two versions of the data set the public one, and when people ask me, I always hmm, do you want the real one? You can't say anything, but you can have it, but yeah. So that's how I solved it. And then the last issue was that the data couldn't be moved. I had to move physically and sit in Cambridge at Intel Research that actually had that data. So I had fortunately no relationship at the time, so my life was easy as a postdoc. It was all about work. I could move and spend six months there eating British food that I didn't like then. It's not that I like it more. I don't want to curious either, but that's it. So that was actually good in terms of output for the data provider. That was really nice. A good positive example for the research community because we should do that. Though we are easy afterwards. When I thought at that time, that was a gamble because it could have ruined my career if it hadn't been published, if I had an issue, and then I would have spent basically one year of my postdoc producing not much. But Actually, that was really useful because we got that CCR 
that got 260 citations, which is pretty good. And you see the citations are constant because people use the thing. It's not like the typical even single papers, like five years and then SDN, nobody cares anymore. So we don't think you should go. And then the community does something else, ICN or whatever. And so your citation pattern depends very much on the place where you publish. So uh, that was uh, actually quite useful. And I have requests still all the time uh, for that. Asset. Then we got free supporting tool because we had to write a tool that reproduces the routing. And that was a natural reading network magazine, so not a real journal paper, but more advertising. Uh, and it got quite a share of citations because people actually use that if you want to replay BGP in the internet large scale. Well, there's not much out there. You use typical simulators, and S2, well, like, good luck. <laughs> good luck, uh, especially internet-wide, reproducing BGP bar, no way. So you, you'll have to do something like that. So that's why it was kind of a, a, a good impact uh, work. Uh, then a few other tools, because the point was to do traffic engineering. So of course, there was a project, in, uh, a new project, uh, that built the totem uh, toolbox that then uses CBGP and basically all the building blocks we had to see the impact of traffic engineering. So uh, that's the free stuff. Then that made a big difference in my career because I got two free sitcom papers from that. Yeah. So that was worth one year because that did change slightly my business card. I don't have to introduce myself. Yeah. And that, that makes a difference. I'm just saying, okay, KPIs or metrics or where you publish or what you get. But yeah, it will make a difference in your life. And so the first one is, well, we thought, hmm, we can replay BGP from public BGP data sets and see what happens. I say, oh, can we build a model? That's not a model. It's just throw the data, replay, and see, hmm, how complete, what we missing, what do people do? And straight accept. Actually, second, but that was uh, really cool. You see citations. It's all right, but actually, fortunately, the good example paper for the research community has a bit more citation. Good. Oh, so, but you see conferences, it peaks a few years, and then it tends to go down. That's the typical conference citations pattern. And then another about another tier one. So we applied it on another tier one. That was a French one. And another sitcom on routing policy. So that was like, yeah, that thread that was worth it. That's why I'm starting with that case study because like, it was a gamble, it was dangerous, but it worked. Well, because in this universe, I'm in this position. If we go 10 years back, I could have just committed suicide as a researcher if it didn't work and lead to as good an output. But you can't know. You have to gamble and try. Now, that was the positive good, like, oh, yes, uh, I was a good researcher with a good endeavor, and I got lucky. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often, sadly. So now we'll get into more real stuff, or like, yeah, more complicated. So the, the second one is a, what I call the failed impact one, those that give you a bit of taste, like, oh, yeah, that was so cool, but the world doesn't agree with that. But how is that possible? People are so visionless. So that was uh, basically, I was at T Labs uh, a few years back, and we were working with Akamai, and then we wondered well, oh, there is lots of contemporary networks out there, like, what well, hey, Really? What's hosting, what's supporting content that's out there on the web? I like, we checked a bit later, just like, no idea. New measurements really at the time, like, hmm, cool, maybe there is an opportunity here. So, uh, for that, well, we basically learned, well, it's not that hard, DNS, and realized, wow, oh, you can do brute force measurements with DNS. You can learn a lot about what people do because DNS is everywhere, whatever you do. Well, you will launch DNS queries. Uh, whatever you do on the browser. And nowadays, a lot of stuff is browser-based. So even streaming or things that are whatever dynamic, mm -mm, it still will rely on DNS to some extent. So you can abuse DNS to do large-scale measurements. Still, really use it. Or if you're interested in 
anything and you said, nah, you can use DNS. It's really cool tool. Quite a few people here actually use it. John is also uh, using it extensively. But then you use, uh, you need a social network because you need these vantage points. Uh, again, Planet Lab, forget it. You need real endpoints as will show you the real DNS behavior and redirection that is being done in different countries all over the world for a set of host names, which was the next problem, finding the right host names that took quite some time to experiment and to converge with. Okay, here is a set of host names that represents Western web content, whatever that means. But you could reuse it for any specific language type of content, or like that's kind of a generic tool at the end of the day. So of course the challenge that again there is no measurement infrastructure, but we've got lots of Facebook friends and they were very happy to run Python scripts for us, as long as you do it right and it's not too intrusive. And then we had to choose the host names what we learned. So what happened? Well, that's one I want to mention. Yeah, we got one paper, uh, I am sorry, but after a bitter sitcom rejection, and that happens quite often, you go to a generic conference that's not measurement based, you say, no, reject. Yeah, it's fine, but it's measurements. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Yep, that's it. <laughs> well, there is IMC, there is PAM, there is TA, like, so go there. Or you're not interesting enough for that community to basically pass the ball. But that's the reality of measurement. But that's fine. But we got it at IMC. So we got also a tool for DNS measurements. I've uh, so been abusing that over the last seven years as well. So that was useful, again, like the previous one. And we got a snapshot, so the data that was made available was like, yeah, not really useful because that's changing too much. So at the end of the day, it was kind of neutral in terms of impact. I mean, the data providers, the users, they didn't care. The research community, yeah, fine, good example, though, yeah, we got the best paper award at IMC that year, but that's because there was no difference between best data set paper award and best paper award. And I talked to the PC chair, he's a good friend, like, oh, he said, oh, yeah, I didn't like your paper, like, seriously, you shouldn't get the best paper award, but the data set was amazing and you did everything, so we had to give it to you. Like, Thank you, I feel so good now. <laughs> But yeah, uh, that was actually useful at the end of the day. So that paper, not so good. And yeah, uh, the community says, well, yeah. uh, we don't really care about that. Fair enough. So you can't pick topics and know in advance whether that's going to be a heavy hitter. <coughs> As for conferences, I'm not expecting it's going to stay there. It will go on lots of whatever. But that's fine. It's just citation. Don't worry about that metric. And then. The tool of the measurements, the DNS hammer that we built in our toolbox, that got actually even more citations. That was a short IMC, straight up set, like amazing. Like, uh, and that has actually more citations than the work itself for, that was the reason for which we actually did this. But yeah. Well, so being your toolbox may be one of your tools actually will have more impact, it will be more important for the community. Now that's a study that is pure advertising, working for your data provider. So, but that's more my business, probably not yours. Uh, that depends what type of measurements you do. But, but don't get stuck into just being doing active or passive. That's a trend I don't like to see in the community. Like some people are like, oh, I've done trace routes all my life. Enough. I'm tired of trace routes. I see a trace route paper. It has to be really, really good. Otherwise, I just reject it because I'm getting moody. I'm like, I've seen enough of that, seriously. So what is there that you're going to tell me that is not poised by your sampling artifacts or like, or like on internet flattening? Like, yeah, sure. Uh, so just one example. But so that means you have to be flexible as a measurement person to say, I'm not going to do one type of measurement. I have something that makes me happy in the process, designing tools or getting things done, working with people, that's what drives me. And then I'll use 
my measurements, the data, and basically have that toolbox that I'm going to use, abuse to make sure I've got the carrier and I can't be fired. And I'm happy. So one of those cases is uh, when you have to work by tradition for a data provider, because that's my core business, get the right data, but you need to be lucky. So that was the IXP paper. That was kind of weird. So we knew from the seminal Ladovitz paper, if you don't know it, you should be ashamed. It's an amazing paper. You have all to have read it here in the room. The Internet in Domain Traffic Come to 10 paper. You need to know that. Anybody who's teaching as well, say like, if you, if you use mental map of the internet, you know what I'm talking. If you use the word hypergiant, or, you know what I'm talking about. Because it, it wasn't wild, but yeah, it was a weak call in the research community. And that doesn't happen so often. So you better uh, read it. It's really good. But basically what they were saying is like, yeah, there are hypergiants, Google, Facebook, like that. Yeah, they consolidate traffic. And yeah, that makes it basically bypass a bit the tier one hierarchy, this old hierarchy model of the internet that we still sometimes see in textbooks. Like, seriously, guys, I know, 15 years ago, that wasn't the case anymore. So maybe it's time to uh, update a bit the textbooks. And one reason was uh, that actually it's not just hypergiants, it's just there are lots of internet exchange points or local exchanges in every country. Like, there are more than, 100, there are probably like 300 of those, depending on how you count, that basically allow people to interconnect locally, the big guys, the content, and the eyeballs, the end users. That's reality. So, but we don't know anything about, oh, we didn't know almost anything about those. I'm like, huh, I see, like, yeah, we know it does kind of relate to whatever, let's call it flat name. I don't like the word, but. And, but actually, we have no reference on anything in the community. Like, it would be nice to have one. So we got lucky with Daniel Feldman. They actually came with the golden plate. Here is the data. Do something with it. Whoa, doesn't happen often. We were in Berlin. I don't know how they found us. Well, I don't know. Well, the reason is that they were interested in SDN. They wanted to know in their fabric, do they use Trio, which is a IGP version, so routing protocol version of their layer two, and they still do using Saki layer two Mac. And that's a pain when you want to do any engineering because mm, layer two is, is tricky. Frankly, it's a pain, yes. So they were interested in that. They never got that answer, sadly, so because we kind of care less. But ah, we took the data, I was like, yeah, let's do something with it, no problem. So that was sampled S flow, which was actually pretty good uh, given the size of uh, that IXP. So imagine that's a network that kind of has <clears throat> a few terabits per second of traffic, which is huge. So it's like a T1 ISP. Uh, so that's a lot. And a T1 ISP won't have that data most of the time. They just sampled it. So that's data. Never again you see it in your life. If you don't take that opportunity, you're stupid. That's not going to happen ever again. So whatever you get or manage to sell from it, it's like worth it. But yes, you have to be lucky and see that line. Now, of course, again, it took six months just to clean up the data and to try to understand what are the customers, what are the endpoints we say, like, oh gosh, that was a pain. And because that was manual verification, uh, going to websites and checking everything. Then the data set size, I can't even remember all that. It wasn't that. Well, it was still at the data center, so we had to ship a machine to work remotely on it and get chunks of the data, but we couldn't afford handling more than one week of traffic at a time on our 10 terabytes server. And no way we would access or touch their data because, well, it's the customer's data. And I see a party people are annoyed about that. So working with data was also a pain, but actually I had done it for Géant, so that was just a bit more painful, but the same type of thing. So the output was amazing, a sick paper, like, yeah, I wouldn't say you can't do much better, but like, that's pretty okay as a paper, I wouldn't spit on it. And lots of follow-up for people in Berlin, I wasn't involved, I moved to uh, uh, the UK from them, that brought lots of publicity for the ASP community, actually, 
not that they care so much, but then the research community realize, wow, there is a world out there, not just that, right? It's not just ISPs, it's also a big set of ISPs. Mm. And they are operators, they matter as much in terms of traffic they carry. So, yeah, ah, it's kind of good publicity. And I got a free EU project for that. Actually, I'm coordinating an EU project, four and a half million, just because I had the right contacts with the IXP and we could say, oh, let's look at this, the answer. But nobody else can do that. So well, if you get your hand on something, nobody can argue. The people say, oh, I something. But you get to be that person. As usual, a few constraints because it's data that needs to be anonymized. And we couldn't share anything. Bad example for the community. Like, yeah, but uh, that was like, yeah, whatever we get out of it, I'm happy to live with the fact that nobody will know ever what was in that data and whether that's actually true. Like lots of papers from AT&T, same situations like, yeah, or Google, Microsoft, let's not point fingers, but like, yeah, uh, you have to trust it. A review can easily say, hmm, I don't buy it. Or show me the data, like, uh, no, uh, private. Uh, indeed, I mean, fair enough. Well, you can't expose certain things legally anyway. So that was good for the ISPs. Uh, bad example, in my opinion, for the research community, or that type of measurement, like, well, we do it because we want to change minds or have impact, but like, mm, it's not nice having to do it that way. And actually, it did slightly change the uh, research community, though it's a bit mild as well. I don't think the research community got it. In the same way as I think this community <coughs> underestimates the power of DNS measurements, they underestimate badly the importance of IXPN measuring, and we still stuck in the ISP <coughs> world of doing the old boring things that, well, that's 10 years ago, it takes time to shift. But tip, yeah, those two things. Yeah, lots of opportunities. So that's the sitcom paper. Uh, usual citations from uh, sitcom. I don't expect that we'll stay up. It's, yeah, it's trendy car. Okay, we got it, fine. We move on to something else. So in terms of impact, it's, you have it at the time or you will miss it. And then the last study, that's more uh, the follow-up from stuff I've actually learned about CDNs and uh, IXPs, it's now ecosystem. That's good because it's an academic. If I hadn't done the stuff before, I couldn't think of that. So that really changed my perception of what matters and what doesn't. And when you do measurements, you have to learn. It's not just getting things out and then moving on to the next one. No, no, like, it really changes your perception of what matters. Like, I'm a networking person, but I can't care less about the network infrastructure. It's that, it's boring, Blew. no. Because things run in data centers. They are at the application layer. They are happening on the web, in cloud, data centers, CDNs, the stuff that users really use. Router buffers, sorry, it was like, who cares? Even as the end, or lots of topics on software defined programs. Really? Like, yeah, yeah, it's 30 years we've been trying with MPLS, with others, like, eh? what do you think you're going to achieve now? So, yeah, you've got to be a bit careful and make sure you learn and evolve, basically, with the studies you actually do. So, basically, that was free Netflix stuff. I didn't care about Netflix whatsoever, uh, but we got a free map of Netflix. I didn't like it. Uh, we're still struggling, so it's still in pro work in process. So we knew there is a strong IXP ecosystem, but we had no idea, okay, in this paper from Labovitz, like, yeah, IXPs are widely used by hyper giants to deliver traffic. Like, yeah, how? What's happening? Oh, well, like to see. I'm a measurement person. I want to try to expose it. So I thought, hmm, now you need a big enough guy to be able to sample it in some way. I'm like, well, Netflix, well, Google, it's hard. I'm not up for hijacking Google or from the inside they won't publish it. Facebook, same thing. So like, there are not that many players that are large enough that give us good visibility of the server side of the internet. And that's kind of tricky as measurements people because that's where things are actually interesting. So, ah, what do you do? Well, you think, okay, what kind of stuff can I use, abuse, DNS, 
whatever, my contacts, anything, and use your measurement toolbox. So we were lucky, basically, in many ways, but you have to be lucky by knowing your stuff technically. So, well, we probed a bit DNS. We know, like, yeah, DNS naming, well, it's kind of quite often consistent uh, when platforms have to be managed and we are large scale. So they do things properly, unlike ISP, actually. Uh, so we managed to realize that, well, the naming of the DNS that Netflix is using actually tells us a lot about <coughs> the location, what type of server, and where they are deployed. Is it within an ISP or within an ISP? Then we were very, very lucky. That's the trick that never works, this IPIB, IPIB field, TCP IP 101, if you know it. So that's one field that might be incremented by, the, by a, a host, though it's kind of a random number. But we've got lucky because Netflix happens to use FreeBSD 3.1 and 3.3, and those use IPID in a linear manner. But they stopped. Ah, so we can't even see the traffic anymore. Yeah, sure. You, you do it once, you expose it, they, they realize it's like, ah, ah, no, no, no. You can't do it anymore. But well, at least it worked once. So, but you need to know like, the tricks to kind of get. But that means we have basically the server deployment and the traffic that is generated by the Netflix server, the whole infrastructure. And we actually even have a ground truth because we check certificates and then they are using certificates to actually make sure that we actually have the full DNS naming structure of Netflix. So cool. Without any help from Netflix, we don't really have ground truth. So, yeah, it's not the Netflix data, but like it won't get closer to that, basically, unless Netflix tells us. So no no paper yet, so that's still work in progress actually, but you see how it's inspired by everything I've done in the past. Visibility amazing. I got CNN on the phone, I got people like, oh, tell us something bad about Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> like, eh, no, actually, even if I want it, all measurements are not endpoint or showing anything with customer like Q, or they wanted to see Q equal. It's like, no, I mean, we don't have that. So like, oh, boring. So we still got a lot of PR from that. I've never done that much PR in my life as a researcher, but that was only for bad reasons and not the research community. Like, okay, fine. And, and we got to meet Netflix that got not too happy, like, ah, come on. You didn't need to release it. Like, well, help us. Oh, no, no. What? So they don't want to work, really. So there was no constraint. It was nice. It was just apply whatever you know and then get something that's really cool. And we got really now a nice insight into the IXP ecosystem because actually Netflix is deployed in 196 countries and from there they have IXP deployments that are like data centers as well as deployments inside ISP. So you got to peek into the internet ecosystem from their viewpoint free. And we learned a lot about that. Netflix, I cannot care less. But this was a cool artifact. So that was really uh, worth it. And then what's the impact? We'll find out that it's going to be interesting to see whether it never gets accepted or it gets accepted and then it dies or who knows. So that's interesting. So you see, I'm not cheating. We'll find out. So that, there is an active paper uh, where basically all the work is actually uh, released and it's under submission. Uh, so let's see. But it doesn't matter. I mean, we learned so much already that for me as an academic, yeah, one more paper, like, oh, fine, you, know, you have a hundred, yeah, and so for the PhD student, it matters a bit more, but yeah. So we wrap up now. I hope I'm doing fine with time. 15, so I still have 15 more minutes. Nice. Is it? Yeah, so that's good, because that's going to be short, lessons learned, because there won't be extra, because we'll do Q&A or hopefully brainstorm, and then when you're bored, we go continue. So what did I learn uh, at the end of the day? You really need to be lucky. But it's not just luck and wait and... No, you need to still be active, have a vision, and think, okay, uh, how can I do things, measure things, and publish things in such a way that 
it's worthy for me, it makes me happy, and the community, and I get stuff out of that. So you need strategic thinking. It's not a random process at all. Oh, it is random because you can't guess what's going to happen at the end of the day. But if you don't try, it won't happen, period. So you, just, you can create uh, your luck by having collaboration networks, work with the right data. Don't be afraid. Collaborate. People are very willing to have your skills added to them, to theirs, to do something useful. Uh, so don't try to be on your own uh, because that will hurt you. Be open. Actually, being open, it feels like, yeah, we don't like, we're afraid, or what if people copy you? Like, yeah, that's the point, but that's called impact. So that's what you should do. Release it and give them you write the first paper, like the ISP paper, and then I didn't bother anymore. I can move on. Yeah, let people cite it, and I get impact. Not that. That's the reason why you do it, but I want to do other things anyway. So don't be afraid of giving away and moving on. That's, that's the way things work. You can craft the right data. You can, yes. Well, if you have passive and then you can. Uh, it's just a matter of getting active data. There are lots of things you can do. You may not see it, you may not understand it or have the right skills. Well, fix that. Work on it. Get the right people. Hire the right people, collaborate, or show you have a vision of, oh, we could do that great paper. Don't worry, I want to work with Marco. It's like, oh, here, I smell a really nice thick of paper. Like, we're going to talk. Don't worry. Like, he won't say, oh, no. Ah, bugger off. No, no, I'm not interested. So, it's easy. But yeah, but then you need the right skills or build them. And that takes time and effort. But you learn it. I'm 40. I feel still young because I see nothing about the internet. Nothing. And I know quite a few things in terms of Raleigh, DNS, CDS, whatever. But what's the next thing? I don't know. I don't know. And I don't pretend I will see it coming. I will learn whatever. Like the Netflix thing, I couldn't see it. Actually, the Netflix thing, just to show you how stupid I was, I got into it because at the time, Netflix was actually using third-party CDNs. And I was interested in cracking the third-party CDNs and their relationships type of thing. By the time that happened, actually, we did the measure like, oops, Open Connect happened, which is the scheme that Netflix is using to deploy their servers. Like, uh-uh, they do it all on themselves. Like, oh, died, that topic. But then, IXP ecosystem, eh, Netflix deployment, eh, they are a worldwide player. Huh, let's see what we can get out of it. So, you see, like, you really have to be open to see opportunities. For that, you need to have a vision. So, you need to understand where the internet is going, what matters. So, be aware, don't just read papers in your limited community. Actually, be active in the member of community, in general conferences, outside measurements to see. I've learned so much about TCP and other things that I don't really care about by being on PCs and serving and doing really well. I don't care about ICN, I don't care about TCP. But like, yeah, but I learned. Well, actually, now I do care sometimes. I even publish on those topics. So be open and understand that people are interested to work with you if you have something good enough, that people might even give you the data if you are the right person. So really, for measurements, if you don't understand that, you will be stuck in always doing the same measurements. So a lot of people are actually ranting. I heard here that in the research community, oh, I got our providers, or ISPs, they don't want to talk to us. I'm like, yeah, there is a reason for that. I don't trust you. And I would be them, I wouldn't trust you, neither. You don't understand their network, you don't understand their needs, you don't understand enough their concerns about anonymity, about how you're going to handle data. This is a tricky one. More and more uh, ethical concerns. Um, what can you do for them? If you can't talk that way to ISP, they will never talk to you. But if you understand that, actually, they are quite open. Right? Yeah, wow. They've got plenty of problems in their network. Don't think they they may not even be aware of that. So actually, the data is an opportunity for you to find out what's wrong in their network. But then you need to understand technically things well enough to convince them that that's the case. So it's a communication barrier. 
But if you know that, once you work for telco, you'll realize, eh, it's not that hard, but you need to know how to do that. And as researchers, we're not interested in that. You know, we want the research, the papers, the cool ideas, and, that, and that's groundwork that, well, you want passive traces from operators? Well, you've got to do it. You also have to be visible and have a good reputation. That's why actually having good cases and having ethics is useful because people in the first place, they need to say, mm, should I trust that person in the first place before we actually talk? And so your reputation will make a difference. The ISP data, we got it because of Anya's reputation. That's it. In Germany, like you want to do network stuff, somebody investigates a networking problem. Mm, yeah, mm, not much choice. So obviously, and they were in Berlin. So, so being the right person and visible citations, whatever, the community, not just for your own sake, yes, that will make a difference as a measurement person. <coughs> and for paper acceptance, actually, that helps you as well. Not to play, but uh, to understand how things work. So you need to really be careful about the ethical standards. Uh, set the bar really high, as early as possible. It's for everything. When we don't set the bar high enough for everything, quality, ethical, we're just used to it and we get slow. Like, yeah, I've always done like, that. Why bother? Like, it's fine. You know, it doesn't make a difference. My salary will not increase. Like, but it will completely change your career, how you do things. So, and that's not too hard to do. And share. So, that were examples where sharing actually was quite useful. And I got lots of impact visibility thanks to that. Though I wasn't too sure, it was kind of a gamble. So sharing is good, and I know that the providers or yourself, you'll say, nah, I'd like to keep the data restricted. And that's why the best data set papers are, awards are so important. Keeping things to yourself is the best way to kill the impact of your work, period. This is suicide. You stupid. I use the word stupid if we actually don't see you should share because if you don't share, people are stuck. What can they do? Compete directly with you, so try to do the same later. Uh, no, so that's the thing. Uh, open things and then let's play as a community in measurements. If we don't share, it's going to be a nasty game. So uh, it's really important that we all do that as a community. Right. That's what I learned. Oh, that's the short version. Thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully you're not bored and feel free to throw whatever, comments, questions, disagreements, anything you want. Thank you. Okay, let's start with Narceo, so he will ask the first question after your talk. <laughs> so, so you put out the emphasis on sharing data. Uh, Sorry? Yes. What's, what's the strategy there? Uh, do you wait for the paper to be published or do you put it online as soon as uh, you have it? That's the one most, that's the best question about this you could ask actually possibly. <laughs> like, what do I do until it's published? And I, hmm, my approach, which I, it's a pragmatic approach and it might be the wrong one. I was like, nah, until it's published. For the sake of protecting the main author, who is never myself, I'm always the last author at my age, well, I, yeah, hmm, that's the bad reason to protect it and say, okay, let's release it only when, just when we have the notification. But the day of the notification, throw it out. Though I don't like that answer. I would like to be able to answer, but I would like because I'm not doing it, to say, mm, no, well, you can release it as early as you want, can, if you didn't care about competition. Or like. Sadly, we live in a world with humans, so <laughs> like you, you have to protect yourself, you know, as well. You can't be that stupid, because there will be cases where, you know, we see papers submitted, and it's like, hmm, it got rejected, and then, oh, I see something similar that came up. <laughs> Interesting coincidence, huh? <laughs> so that happens, so yeah. That's the tricky bit, but yeah, that's 
a matter of timing. Now, hopefully, indeed, the timing is not so important that a few months won't make such a difference for the impact. The, you're right. You're saying, mm -hmm. It's a tricky question, ethically speaking. So I have two things. One is an agreement and one is... A disagreement. Disagree. I like people no, who disagree. Uh, agreement. Oh. Let's <laughs> <laughs> fight. This is not positive, right? Um, I apologize. Okay, fine. Fine. Um, <laughs> we disagree offline. So, <laughs> so in agreement, um, from the perspective of big companies that have data, yes, they fundamentally need a motivation. Like the idea of being a researcher and saying, hey, I want to look at your data because I think it's really cool. It never gets anywhere. Um, no. I, and I've spent a lot of time on the inside of a big company trying to get data out. And there are enough hurdles with legal issues and business issues that if you can't answer the question why, you're not even going to get into the room with the lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, fundamentally, motivation is... Yeah, though, I'll let you continue, but I have a comment on that. Indeed, though, and I know that because I work also for operators. Sometimes it's easier to have the researchers do the stuff that inside in the company, because of organizational politics, you can't actually do yourself. So you are offloading the work to a researcher or a collaborator. Sure. So actually, so, sometimes, yeah, yeah there, there, there you're are right. Google yes. Stuff out. Mm. Yeah, we would like somebody else to do yes. this because we can't. Yeah. Um, the other one is, um, so there are certain types of public data sets. You mentioned the Alexa DNS yep. tracks, for example. Um, be varied, I would suggest, for people working with this kind of stuff. Be varied in the data sets that you're looking for. Um, there are lots of papers out there that use the Alexa top 1 million. Right? Yeah. You know that the top 1 million is very noisy. But also, the top 1 million was retired in November last year. Mm. Like Alexa decided to kill it. Now, yeah. The last time I checked, the data is <coughs> being regenerated. But there are some of these sources you can't necessarily yeah. trust. And what sample of users is that? Yeah. Like, imagine it's Nasio who does studies with really end users. Yeah. That's a specific sample. The what Alexa sample does Alexa give us? We don't know. The Alexa, the Alexa one is really weird. Is mm. um, but, but the good thing is Alexa is country specific, so you can craft also yeah. subsample countries as a way to compensate for the bias. There is still an unknown bias. Yeah. yeah. But on that one in particular, other top million data sets exist. Um, yeah. There is plenty out there yeah. usable, but like, if, if we, we just don't know. We need to see more papers that use more of these rather than say, yes. yeah, we use Alexa. Actually, yes, so that's a good point. There's lots of data out there unexploited yet. And we just need to have the vision and realize us as measurement people who have the skill, who could actually do something out of it. But we, weren't, we didn't know. We just know the kind of the usual ones, but actually there are lots out there. You're right. John. So, uh, so your last poem was about data sharing and encouraging people to release data openly. Um, I, I love that, but I'm struck by the fact that a lot of important papers, including your XP paper, use proprietary data. You can't. Um, and your bullet above that was about ethics, and you know we talked about privacy a little bit, stuff like that. I'm wondering, should we as a community perhaps be more willing to deal with some level of less than automatic downloading of data, some level of agreement or or uh, to get access to data that might be sensitive. You mean have organized schemes so that data can be shared actually more easily? Or, or some level of accountability or something. It mm. seems like people have this expectation. If I can't click and download it right now, yeah. it's not free. It's not, that's mm. not good. Um, people have very low tolerance. I'm wondering if... if that's true. That's but maybe. I mean, they, they have, there are a few repositories, like Kaida has one in Europe, there is one as well. I mean, FTW has been involved in that one. But no offense, that doesn't seem to work that when unfortunately that people don't push it up and I don't know what's the problem is it that well you need metadata you need to clean up and then you see how embarrassing the content might be already like oh I didn't do things properly I don't know what's the reason that prevents us indeed from pushing things up into repositories but indeed I think the community 
can do better. So I'm no role model in that area, so <laughs> I can't say. So I just shut my mouth and let people who may have actually a good, uh, who, who might be role models in that. But you're right that, yeah, sharing, there is lots of, out, of things out there that could be cross-correlated or reused that just dies and we let ourselves actually down by killing our own impact, by not working on this. But yeah, yeah, we've, we're busy doing other things, sadly, and that's the wrong reason. Someone else? So actually, just a comment on uh, sharing of data. You know, I'm doing a lot of passive measurement, and mm. sharing the data is complicated for privacy reasons, but also for practical reasons. Sharing uh, 20 terabytes of data mm -hmm. is not that yes. easy. So our policy is to, instead of uh, moving the data somewhere so that anybody can go and fetch it, drop me an email. I will be yep. very happy if you come to yes. me and work with our yes. data. So Yes, indeed. And that, that was the point also that kind of John made. Like, yeah, you need to request, like, don't be shy, you know. Yeah. Ask for it, otherwise you won't get it. And actually, more than we even actually realize, people are willing to actually give the data. Because of course, you get the data, I'm gonna cite your paper. So, they are very happy that you're actually getting it. But seriously, no, it's, so it's, it's not possibly a good reason, but yeah, that's the way the world works. Actually, I would like to support that, because from our, from our perspective, most of the data that we work with is kind of a, from a sensitive, of a sensitive nature, and it's even sensitive where you don't really expect it. So, for example, we have one project running where we do massive calls of, of ENS data daily. Um, and in principle, DNS data is not, it shouldn't be sensitive because mm -hmm. it's open, yeah. but it's with DNS, it's just, you get what you ask for, and you have to know what you ask for. Yeah. And this, we get it from zone files. The zone files are mostly we obtain it um, under an NDA, so it's unclear of mm. what, we can, what we can release. Yeah. The question is often, we do a lot of measurements on the DNS data, HTTP2 adoption, all sorts of things. The question is, a legal question, what kind of derivative data sets can you re derive from, mm. can you release from that? Yes. And that's a legal question, and I'm always like, you mentioned yeah. it, we're busy with tons of other things. If the legal issues get complicated, yeah. we kind of yes. try to delay it. In the, and then it's often the, the, the point that we don't put most of the data up on the public because that's a legal challenge. But if somebody would drop us an email and say that, yeah, well, we would establish a side channel too. Yeah. So yes. I would, I would kind of support that. Too. And that's actually quite an issue because nowadays, when you get research funding, research grants, you're supposed to share the data. So imagine I want to work with somebody who's got NDA issues. I have an EU project with DeckX. Like, well, if you want it, you could tell us you want give us the money back, or because you should be able to give some data or like, but we can't. So that will get worse. Fortunately, I'm old enough, so it's going to be less of my problem and more of yours. But more and more, uh, releasing the data for reproduci re reproducibility reasons, which makes a lot of sense, or just because it's public money that is being used to handle it to some extent. Does it make it public data? Well, but, well, that would be a trend that people indeed have to be aware of. And so that's why you need a legal hat to know in advance, do I play trick in advance so that I won't be stuck later on with my NDA? They're like, oh no, you cannot do any derivative of the main work. Like German law is a pain in the butt for that where you have to specify the use case and any other use requires another NDA, another agreement, otherwise you can't release anything. And, I, and yeah, so the law, we need to work on it and be aware just to be sure that doesn't hit us. Happy to be in Italy where the law is just a suggestion. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Some, any other question? What time for cafe? Time to, yeah, time cafe. For Okay, thank you. Thank you. Excellent.